what does it mean cancer is an evolutionary process? What does, what does evolutionary process mean? Um, when, we say, when we say these words, we usually mean Darwinian evolution in the following sense. Uh, first, there are mutations. Mutations are random. Uh, mutations arise independent of selection that will act on them. And later, selection will choose individuals that have mutations, uh, providing those individuals with sort of some advantages. So that's a, that's, a, that's a traditional sort of understanding of evolution. Now, cancer is certainly an evolutionary process. People started realizing this in 1970s. Uh, in a couple of papers published back then, they say, whoa, we've been studying cancer for many years, and now we realize that it's an evolutionary process. In what sense cancer is an evolutionary process? Uh, cancer starts from a single cell. The single cell acquires the first mutation that makes it a little bit more like a cancer cell. The cell starts dividing more rapidly. Uh, it's less sensitive to mechanisms of the organism that suppresses cell division. And it may acquire the next mutation that will make it even more like a cancer cell. And again, now there is not a single cell. Now there are ma many cells that are, that are all sort of um, came from that, from that sing single cell. One of the cells will acquire a mutation that will make this individual single cell more fit or more like a cancer cell. For example, it might be a mutation that increases the mutation rate itself. Or it might be a mutation that makes the cell um, easier to evade the immune response. So now, again, there is selection for such cells within the, within the body of the cancer. So this cell now becomes a founder of the, of the, of the sort of next generation of, of cancer cells. Again, that's another population of cells, another mutation. So mutations constantly arise at random. And then there is selection for cells that are more and more and more aggressive as cancer cells. So cancer is certainly an evolutionary process. Moreover, a prototypical feature of, of um, malignant tumors is metastasis. So what does it mean metastasis? Again, cells constantly leave the body of cancer, get into the bloodstream. Again, they all carry different mutations. And now if some of the cells carry a mutation that allows the cell to sort of to adhere some way in the body to a new place and sort of start settling there, that's a mutation that gives an advantage to the cell. So that's typical evolutionary event. So in this sense, cancer is an evolutionary process. So what's the history of the subject? Uh, again, as I told you, people started thinking about this in 1970s. Uh, but again, it was hard to, to prove or disprove this, this concept because largely until very recently, we were unable to see what are the mutations in cancer cells. Nowadays, we have sequencing and uh, moreover, we have what's called cancer genome projects. Cancer genome projects are constructed around usually specific types of cancers and patients that carry these uh, types of cancers. A sample is taken from the cancer and a sample is taken from another tissue in the same uh, patient. And then they're sequenced. So you read the, the letters of the genome inside the cancer and you read the sequence of the letters in a normal tissue. And then you compare the two and you see, oh, in the normal tissue, it was letter A, and here it's letter G. So that's one of the mutations in cancer cells. And you can identify this way many, many mutations that are present in cancer cells. Um, and this is, that's what's called cancer genomics projects. Now we have hundreds to maybe thousands of cancer samples where sort of these mutations have been identified. There are different types of mutations in cancer. Generally, there are different types of mutations. Uh, these are not necessarily changes in a single letter in DNA. That might be, for example, some region of DNA is completely lost, completely cut out and lost. Some regions of DNA might be cut out and amplified. And in the normal tissue, I would see like one uh, region. In the cancer, I would see 10 exact copies of this region in the same chromosome and different chromosomes. So there are amplifications and deletions. Moreover, the whole chromosome can be amplified or a whole chromosome can be lost. So there are, there are these big events uh, where large so volumes of genetic material are gained or lost in cancer. But again, this is, we believe is, is happening by Darwinian selection, by Darwinian evolution, sort of mutations and selection. First, mutations arrive. So essentially all letters are bombarded by mutations. Mutations happen. 
But then selection gives advantage to those cells where mutations made them more like cancer cells. Uh, again, people have identified as a classics of, of cancer, cancer biology. There are oncogenes, and mutations in oncogenes make these cells more like cancer cells. So they're making them more uh, malignant. There are tumor suppressors. These are genes, and their function is to protect our cells from becoming cancer cells. So mutations in tumor suppressors sort of essentially kill or diminish ability of cells to protect themselves from cancer. So you need two types of mutations. And these mutations, again, it's, it, it, by sequencing, we know that this mutation happens. Um, and that's what drives cancer progression. Mutations in oncogenes and, and, and tumor suppressors. Collectively, we call these mutations drivers. So these are drivers of cancer progression. So now, what I just told you is sort of classics of, of, of cancer biology. However, sort of this evolutionary thinking about cancer adds another dimension to this. And the dimension is the following. So if you think about evolutionary process, you can't get mutations that would provide you advantage and no other mutations. So as you sit and wait for the mutations that give advantage, you also get lots of random mutations. So what's happening to those random mutations? Do we actually see them in cancer genomes? So, it, and the same is true actually for any Darwinian evolutionary process. There are lots of random mutations. And selection favors um, organisms that carry good mutations and don't have too many bad mutations. So what do we see from cancer genomics? So when the first cancers were sequenced, the surprise was the number of mutations. We know from um, cancer biology and from sort of all the analysis of uh, cancer incidence curves at what age cancer um, uh, is likely to appear, that about five, maybe five to ten mutations are needed for cancer to progress. So the expectation was that we would go into cancer, sequence a cancer sample, compare it to normal, and see five to ten mutations. How surprised everybody were when they saw like tens of thousands of mutations. Not five or ten, but tens of thousands of mutations. Say, hmm, that's strange. But then you sequence another patient with the same type of cancer, another tens of thousands of mutations. Another patient, tens of thousands of mutations. So by doing this for male, and then you don't know which five actually drive progression and which, which five are actually neutral or may play some other role. So the problem is sort of similar to, to all other comparative genomics problems. You compare a human genome to a genome of chimpanzee, and you see lots of differences. And you don't know which of these differences are neutral, and which differences are making us different from chimpanzee, or we believe smarter. So the approach here is similar to the approach of, com of in comparative genomics. You can take this sam cancer sample, sequenced cancer samples, from, say, 50 patients, and see which genes were mutated in which patient, and just look across this, um, this data set and say, OK, this gene was mutated only in one patient. This gene was mutated maybe in two patients. And then say, oh, and this gene was mutated in almost every patient. So that you use as a signature of uh, a mutation or a gene that's involved in cancer progression. So when we compare, to, so when, 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 when sort of we as a community of, of, of cancer biologists compared uh, mutations observed in different cancers, we found that only a handful of these tens of thousands of mutations are recurrent. So they appear in the same gene in many different patients. Or maybe even the exact specific mutation may happen in, 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 in many patients. Most of these tens of thousands are non-recurrent. So they're individual in individual patients. So another dimension of this is the question of selection. What is selection acting on? why selection selects for cells that are more cancer-like cells rather than selecting for cells that are more like normal. Um, there is no clear answer to this question. Uh, certainly, if you have a population of cells, and they're all non-dividing, and then one cell starts dividing as crazy, it will eventually take over the population. So in this cell, sense, it has an advantage. So selection is in, in, in cancer progression, essentially selects for cells that are able to divide faster, grow a bigger population, and sort of uh, be protected 
from all the mechanisms that our bodies have to actually kill these types of cells. Because we have lots of mechanisms not to develop cancers. Our immune system would try to kill the cells, uh, will secrete certain, certain sort of um, signals that would stop progression of such cells. Let's look at an example. Imagine that you have now the first mutation arrived, the cells now can grow faster. But uh, now the organism starts secreting um, a signal telling all the cells to stop dividing. And they should stop dividing if they're normal. But now imagine that one of them had a mutation that made it insensitive to the signal. This single sort of misbehaving cell will actually have a huge advantage over others because others will stop dividing and this one will take over. So this way, this mutation that made it insensitive to the stop signal actually made it through the population became a very popular mutation. Another dimension of this is how come that our cells have these mechanisms to divide uncontrollably, to lose ability to respond to stop signals, and to become cancer. It's kind of interesting that, I don't know, I'm, I'm always mystified by this question, so why there is such a state of the, uh, of, of, of the body that sort of some cells divide uncontrollably, and there is no such state that we grow a third arm, All right? So, there are, there are some hypotheses in the literature. Again, now that we start seeing, start looking deep into this evolutionary process by, by tools of genomics, um, we start realizing that sort of maybe what's happening is that our cells came from, we all came from single cell organisms. And some of the machinery that our cells had while they were single cell organisms is still present. On top of this machinery, lots of other things have been built, such that cells now will learn to interact and become more altruistic, contributing to the general good of the organism. But there is still this core machinery. And essentially what's happening is that there is, a hitch, there is essentially a sort of a hijacking of this machinery. This machinery takes over and cells roll back in, in evolutionary time, millions of years back and become sort of this single cell egoistic, uh, actively dividing cells, the way they were uh, billions of years ago.